Ja, um, unser nächster Talk hier in uh, our next talk is here in Dextra. It's a little bit complicated theme, cyberstalking, when lines are crossed. It's delivered by Jan Kavitzer, who is an MD in psych, uh, psychiatric MD um, in Berlin. He researches uh, about technical development and has written a book called Digital Paranoia. And his co-talk is psychological, this, uh, psychological, psychological, damn it, Psych, psychiatrist, sorry. I do the slides. Hello. We are Corinna and Jan. I give an introduction because I uh, research this theme. Basically, uh, basically, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts do not observe their patients in uh, social media. Um, we do not stalk our clients. Nonetheless, I read a lot of Twitter and Facebook and I want to find out how aggressions work. I was once part of an international shitstorm. <laughs> I never could manage to have a fight on Twitter. We all have contact in our professional fields with stalking and we are projection screens for uh, our patients and we have to draw lines. We also work with people who are stalkers. I want to say a couple of words about that. First of all, I would like to speak about our relationship to psychiatry. Do you, anybody know the Rosenhan experiment? Anybody else? Okay. Um, das Rosen -Experiment wurde von the Rosenhan experiment was done by David Rosenhan and was way a, an important experiment for the psychiatry in the United States. David Hovenran uh, proved how arbitrary psychiatric diagnoses are. I'd like to sh introduce you to this experiment. He, uh, Rosenhan was a psychologist and um, sent work uh, his colleagues into um, psychiatric um, hospitals and they said that um, they are hearing a voice that are saying meaningless words nothing else and they were admitted at psychiatric hospitals and f sometimes were treated for um, for weeks and weeks and at the beginning they were giving notes but nobody took them serious and nobody took them serious for example uh, one of the people asked uh, if I can when I, can I get uh, out of here? And the doctor never reacted to his request. The, the diagnostics of psychiatry are arbitrary. Even though these people were totally normal, and as soon as you have a diagnosis, um, this is a stigma to you, and people will treat you differently. There was one clinic that said, that would never have happened to us. And that was really the beautiful part of this experiment. And Rosenhan said, okay. Okay, so the clinic said, send us your actors and we, we will sort them out. And, and they thought, uh, whoa, maybe 42, maybe 45 people were actors from Rosenhan and but Rosenhan never sent them anything and so this was the second proof <laughs> so then there was another stigma in place of being an actor and not really psychiatrically sick at this time they wanted to establish clear categories of uh, mental illness 
and Rosenhan proved that this is super arbitrary. And on the other hand, there was a lot of scientific research uh, that was supposed to be standardized. For So if you have a couple of symptoms for a time A, B and C, um, you get a diagnosis no, no matter what, what you do before or what you do after that. When you had a personal tragedy and then you develop a depression, then you get the same diagnosis as somebody who has developed the symptoms out of clear blue sky. We have totally reproducible diagnosis, but but they are not um, they're not fitting with humans, and that's a huge risk in psychiatry. And I think that psychiatric diagnoses are important when they save people from arbitrary um, actions. The people sitting alone in their practices, and it would be terrible if people just um, imagined stuff like in the Rosenhan experiment, when people just said, let's do this with you, when people already have that much power about others. Um, you use diagnosis when they are actually useful, not to um, judge and stigmatize people. Now, if some words with a victim and um, perpetrator um, definition. We try not to use these words, and we're saying doers and uh, done tos. <laughs> this is usually very clear a person who gets stalked by others who just don't know them and just want a victim um, because they want to feel powerful or want to make others feel bad this can be very one-sided but there are uh, cases where it's a <laughs> say self-strengthening spiral or devil spiral and so there's this dynamic where people uh, are um, ghosting each other. Ghosting is where someone cancels contact, doesn't uh, react to messages anymore. Maybe you were a couple before and the one person ghosts and the other person doesn't even notice they're a stalker but tries to get some clarity and gets ever and ever more threatening messages and the other people react and um, maybe their social competence is missing and there's this self-strengthening circle and the question is how do we solve this conflict ideally? If we have one person that stalks another, there's one important aspect we don't talk about much uh, enough, that we can solve this uh, with more people, like um, data security it has to be done with other people. And stalking is the same, can't really say. I'm being stalked, uh, what can I do? And you can say, do this and this, and it will help. You, you need to tell other people around this person. And I see someone around me is, is afflicted. I have to ask, okay, what's going on? How can I help? But it's just as important. Can you see that? Just as important that the humans around the doing person Stalking stems from couples, from divorces. It's very important that everyone around the doing person reacts. If you see this person is very aggressive against someone else, writing messages, you ask, what, what are you doing there? What's going on? You don't do with a perpetrator victim differentiation. Instead, you just ask both what's going on. So there's not this defensive stance people have to take. The problem is with that is, of course, 
around the doing person, some will see this is not okay behavior, but there will always be allies. And nowadays, some of you will know this, there are groups coming from anonymity, destroying people. On Twitter, you can see this a lot of time. Mostly women. This woman is too self-justified. We will attack her. But if it's from a divorce, there are both sides, mostly. In such a situation, it's important to not exclude people from the social community at once or threaten it. Because the problem is we are in a big restructuration where um, values are changing. And if we um, react too harshly against um, crossing the lines of these new limits and make shame, shame people, we make a border to that to that society, society, that community, and we exclude the person. And this may cause some people to want to go away from that person. If you do this, if you stalk, we don't want to be on your side. But this leads to allyship with others outside of the community, which is growing, where people who are not uh, doing okay things, they're just making groups outside of the pl um, major society. And these people feel very uh, good in their uh, bubble. And the dramatic thing is that these things what we're doing don't really help. When positive reinforcement would work much better. But this, these um, means don't work with people who are outside of society already. If you're outside of society, what can we do to you? There's nothing, really. And if you push people into the perpetrator role too much, it gets toxic because they get nihilistic, they get cynical, and you can't talk to them anymore. And there's a situation where you have to, re to react you have to exclude people from society, community. You have used the hardest sanctions you can get, of course. But I would say, for for the introduction, we have to think about how to what what do doses of an action we want to use to um, be effective. That we may. Hass verbreiten, bei denen eh alles egal ist, nur 4,9 Prozent der Bevölkerung stehen und nicht mehr 15. And we have to try to reduce the amount of people who are outside of the community being hateful and spiteful. I would uh, like to, in the end, say um, how you can find help within and without the system, how you can find helpers helpers outside of the psychiatric system. It's completely fine not to go to your therapist if you don't want to, just because you don't share their point of view or their process of thought. I think that we are kind of overstepping every once in a while. There's a lot of times where stuff was dealt with within a family and you would have gone to, to a priest or to like someone else and that weren't considered a disease, but a considered a problem within society and now they're being individualized. And now you alone your individual have to go and see a therapist. I think that's wrong. I believe that's wrong. I don't think that's necessary. But if you do want to seek help, you should consider two criteria. When it comes to stalking, it's important that you need to find people that think beyond the schemes of perpetrator, predator and victim. If you go to somebody who will say we're not talking to, to predators, that can cause the problem is that that will not solve the situation. If you're in a person that's affected and you would realize you would like to aim for a mediation and you have somebody at your side who is like thinking in this clear schemata, it's important to find somebody that's beyond that kind of system. It doesn't necessarily mean that they can't take your side in this, but you need to understand that they need to get involved. Uh, you have to also consider that helpers 
should not be emotionally involved. If you have groups where people who help and are allies and are completely emotional, dedicated to this problem, then that can lead and become to a problem for those that are getting helped because they're not thinking rationally anymore and because people that are getting if you have too much empathy you cannot help well i mean this sounds strange to you but if you feel everything that the person that you're trying to help then you're going to be exhausted quite quickly and that's the other danger the, the helper syndrome i mean it's quite a familiar term it has the big problem that if people privately like to help a lot and are emotionally involved all the time they could be addicted to this, they could be codependent on this. And this big problem of codependency when it comes to the helper syndrome, if you're a helper, if you're a part of the community that helps, that don't, that are not in these classical structures and that need this feeling of being a helper, they need the problem to sustain because they need the other people to have the problem because then they can continue to help. So sometimes that's something that you need to be careful and watch out for and you get out of that and those are two things that I want to pass on advice. Therapists have realized this, and those are the two things that I want to give you as an advice for support systems, and I would uh, pass on for, to you. Exactly. I would like to define stalking. We heard a lot about stalking. I would like to go deeper on the meaning. The word stalking comes from the English language. It appeared firstly in the 80s, was translated from stalking, from the hunting language. In the 80s and 90s, it was used for fans stalking their ideals stalking their idols and threatening them. That's where the Germany come from and was introduced in this way into the German language. The phenomenon of stalking was introduced into law making in 2007-2008 with an explicit paragraph. Stalking is not a phenomenon, phenomenon of the modern times, we find it in Ovid's metamorphosis, in the media in the 90s, it was reached in the light of the uh, popular culture. The first definition that I found in the scientific context was a definition by Dresing and Gast. 2003, it was defined as, as a pattern uh, of behavior where one person follows, disturbs and threatens somebody else based on, on uh, and basically potentially also attacks them physically and in some cases even kills them. So there's a bunch of other criteria that are being applied to these studies. Um, I wanted to um, kind of point out the central aspects of studies. Uh, some like there's a temp like temporal uh, scope of this. Like some people say it's two weeks, three weeks. Uh, that's question of debate, to be honest. Uh, there's so the criteria, formally formal criteria that are important. Uh, there's the second one, the second definition that we're going to cyber stalking. Um, we have another talk after this, uh, just to that we all know what we're talking about. Cyber stalking um, is something that within media is highly discussed. Um, the academic uh, database, however, um, is not very well elaborated, and there's not big. There's no big studies done so far. So what we can say so far is that the definition based on dressing and others is cyber stalking is the contentful uh, repeated and unwished for contact based on computer uh, communication techniques and um, that by using these techniques uh, there is uh, de happening defamation um, threats uh, those are kind of the central uh, criteria for definition of cyber stalking it's not its own entity it's a part of 
stalking in the grander scheme. So cyber stalking is a sub form of stalking or one means of expression of stalking. There's very few stalking cases or no stalking takes, uh, cases where cyber stalking is not part of the stalking process itself. What I would like to quickly introduce is the epidemiology, uh, how, how much stalking is actually happening. So there's a couple of studies that were done. There's one that was from 2015, this is the one most current from Hellmann and Klim. It's a quite representative study um, and it's about how popular, in uh, quotation marks, is stalking. So um, the um, lifetime prevalence is about 20% within women. Um, within women, there's uh, factors such as uh, current relationship, if you live alone or with other people, is something that, uh, and this can then go up until uh, 32%. The the curious thing about this study is that they tried to uh, find out who are the stalking executors. Are this only men? Are these women? The affected people by stalking. Uh, the, it, it showed the study showed that um, 64.6 percent were women, and in those cases the executors were largely male, 60.2%, and only 4.4% women. Whereas by male uh, people were affected by stalking, this uh, quota turns around and women are um, the majorities of the um, stalking executors, so that's 23.5%. And um, as mentioned before, Cyber stalking, there is no actual representative epidemiological studies done yet. But what we know so far, next slide, please. In the past, there was a uh, divide between traditional stalking by telephone, unwanted telephone calls, SMS, and personal, um, personal looking for the perp person sending packages cyber stalking if you're looking at it very few studies are actually exist um, usually people use uh, seek contact over social media chat email or blogs if you look at it how concretely do they manifest the episodes M mostly these two methods are combined so new techniques of cyber stalking are part of the mix especially as psychologists we asked ourselves and you also why do people stalk for us this question is important in our professional context why we ask this question what are the motives why do we want to understand that so it's about helping people who are uh, the done bys or doers and that's why we have to understand why and how people stalk the motives that lie behind that and on top of that what we want to do is help people and also the risk factor analysis is there a, um, a danger here for people for people who are done tos or third person actors and if we look at the this collection of motives i would like to uh, go a little deeper in these four t kinds of motives and to show the reasons behind these reasons um, the first motive is loneliness and seeking of love behind that we have uh, emotions like loneliness, f uh, missing of love, and they want to create an intimate relationship, um, uh, looking for soulmates. People are looking for soulmates. The focus is not on... And they create fictive or even... Yeah relationships and uh, to substitute real relationships the real 
acting of the done bys um, has no consequence on the doer. For people who do this out of these motives, uh, the done bys are usually known in the wider social circus circles. We often have uh, schizophrenic patients with that love drunkenness, love mania. Loneliness is a big part of that. I'm not happy about loneliness. And uh, research is called social incompetence. Um, so this is the motive behind that. The wish, the longing for human contact. It's not about finding your soulmate. It's about establishing friendship or sexual relationship. Mostly, mostly um, targets are here people who are unknown to the stalker. The, the modes of reaching contact are very, very... Um, the background of these people is mainly that uh, these people have uh, somewhat limited capabilities when it comes to social skills, uh, which is important to know for uh, giving these people help. Um, what's important for people affected by by um, executors of stalking of this uh, shape or form is that the stalkers will narrow down and reduce their behavior uh, once they realize that they are not successful with it. This is not true for everyone, but it's true for a large group of people that fall under and act out of this motive. The other one, the next group is uh, rejection, uh, seeking um, resolution or revenge. A lot of times these are really close, uh, closely related to the people who are affected, ex-partners, friends, um, triggers of these usually are the ending of a relationship. So stalking compensates the loss of that intimate relationship. So it's a way of trying to keep this relationship up. And um, a lot of times um, people who are executing the stalking are, are reporting that the relationship can't be over. They have a very, a very strong focus uh, on the end of the relationship and how that's something that they want to avoid by all means. A lot of times the motives that are prevalent are on the one hand resolution, but at the same time revenge. So you, you feel rejected and, and, and denied and, and this kind of these two motives are being mixed and the ambivalence within emotions is, is, is already prevalent. Okay, so that another motive is um, to be diminished and this usually is coupled with uh, seeking revenge as well. Subjectively speaking, uh, people who are uh, being executors of stalking of this kind, they feel um, completely like they've lost control and they are seeking to regain uh, power and control because they feel humiliated. And the last motive of the five big ones is, is mainly driven by power and sexuality. And those are mainly uh, stalkers, executing stalkers, sadists. Uh, it's a small, very small group of people. And if we look at these, look at the next slide, um, consequences for people who stalking, affected by this sort of stalking is uh, obviously 50% uh, of people report they have symptoms of um, a psychological disease like panic attack, uneasiness, uh, loss of control. This continuously in heightened stress levels. And this is the manifestation. This can like enable psychological um, things to develop. Some people develop um, problems sleeping. Um, people tend to have a complete behavior driven towards security and they are afraid. And this 
over long term leads to loss of social content, uh, contact and they need to move, they need to change job in order to avoid the stocking. This can obviously have economic consequences as well and all these factors um, basically uh, are the laying the groundwork for psychological uh, problems to develop further. Stock, the ones who are executing the stalking are also described, if I can quickly, so people who are executing the stalking are also drawing back from their social networks, their social circles, and they're primarily engaging in their stalking behavior. So that's uh, it's a sickening fixation. What happens is so uh, they will start relating to other people who are uh, engaging in the same kind of behavior. So this is kind of like a circle of death. So these descriptions of these dynamics of perpetrators, the way that they are perceived, we're, we're talking about the people who are executing this, they're being perceived as perpetrators only. And the surrounding can act on this. Um, if the people around them say, well, maybe this is somebody that just feels lonely and we need to have this analysis to do something. I mean, the, the surroundings need, if you are realizing that somebody around you is fixating on one person, you, especially in the beginning and the early steps, you can step in and intervene and you can help, obviously, first of all, help the person who are affected, but maybe also the person who's the one who's executing this. Um, most of all, the request was to ask, how can I help when people around me, when there is a case of stalking uh, in my environment, maybe someone is doing it or is uh, done on two. The important thing is, like Jan already talked about, the that the stalkers are the, they, they keep their social contacts because they need them. We have this model of this our psychical uh, health is like a house, and like the the foundation of that is like the social environment, social contacts. And the others are like work, other uh, identity. Um, creating things and the, the less you have of these the more unstable uh, this house becomes your your health deteriorates and you have to keep this foundation and people who are stalked tell them you are not alone we are there and these strong emotions that people who get stalked feel like loss of control you have to compensate for that and what you have to watch out for if you want to help that you look out for your own limits because you you could also feel loss of control and you have to know how to handle these emotions and know your own limits in your head and with this helpful measures go go to information places um, to, to psychologists do stuff uh, together so, so don't focus too much on the spoke uh, on, the, on the stalking but also what can we do together um, strengthening the relationship the quality of relationship and yeah, we only have five minutes left so we have to go a bit faster Oh, so we couldn't do it faster, so whatever, it's okay. That's fine. The important thing is, like we said, know your own limits and say, okay, it's also important. Some, some say they feel anger and you know, I want this to stop. I will go to them and say, tell them, stop this. We would say, don't do that. 
don't um, be an in intermediate because the dynamics can go wild very easily. So let's not do that, especially if you don't know other factors. If you have a stalker, don't, don't force them, don't insult them. It's important that you say, hey, this is not okay, your behavior, but that you also say that you care for your friend and that you are worried about your friend. Like, have these social contacts, give the, them the possibility to get help or whatever. So this too, there's the social function, it's very important. It's also important to not be intermediate in this place. And of course, to look out for your own limits. Yeah, that's the most, most the central thing is the, uh, like, breaking the isolation. So, so you can still have, have um, some kind of sanction left and that for the stalked person, the um, mental health impacts aren't too, too, too great and like below half of stalked people are lo looking for psychological help and that's not cool. Like in therapy, call it therapy, we try to help them. How do you cope with this? Um, and, and like obsessive thoughts, thoughts and stuff that we try to um, limit this. Like what, what are the consequences if you are always afraid to go out? Um, if you are always afraid of the stalker. So yeah, this will bring more social isolation and like your health problems will get worse and we will try to get out of this uh, vicious circle. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> I believe mostly that uh, yeah, the white ring, how to analyze stalking. I would, I would like to show you the interventional program of the white ring. It's a, if you are stalking is done to you, uh, you can go there and they will help you. Um, they will analyze your s state. What, how is it looking? Is there the threat of violence? Does it make sense to go to the police? Um, they will help you, they will advise you, um, they will always look um, how are you doing. They help you psychosocially, their groups, they yeah, will talk to you. And this exists concretely in Berlin, but also in other parts of Germany. Uh, and there are also programs for people who stalk. Um, where are group settings and, and these themes are rose and what are your motives, what lies behind that and they will give you strategies that are fitting to your motives and if you need that, find that on the internet. Thank you. Thank you.